sorry for that interruption earlier. Uh, I was the voice of chaos looming. Um, wow, there's a, there's a lot of you. Cool. Hi, everyone. This is really exciting. Um, uh, I would like to start by thanking Creative Mornings just for doing this whole thing. I think this is a really, really special initiative, um, a really special program. There's a lot of creative people in Richmond, but um, I could tell you from my days as a musician and trying to get a read as far as this as a touring market, um, it kind of has a reputation as a place where people don't come out a lot and people kind of stay in, or at least it had. Um, so the, the, the impression I was given of Richmond from afar was that a lot of creativity, people don't come out. Um, and then I moved to Richmond and I, I don't go out anymore. Um, <laughs> But so it's great that we have something like this to force us out of our homes and our comfort zones. Oh, we'll get to that. Chaos is the topic of the day. Um, and to just come and be with each other. So super honored to be here. So thank you to the Creative Mornings team. Thank you to Capital One for hosting. Um, my name is Matt Perhoney. I'm going to be talking about chaos. First, if you will indulge me, um, real quick, I, I know there's one person, like at least one person that will be watching the, the replay of this, and that is my dad who is currently volunteering with the Red Cross, um, bringing relief, disaster relief, to people uh, that have been victimized by Florence. So, um, yes. We could. For my, dad, for my dad and for everyone who right now is going to the front lines of chaos and, and helping people in need. Let's, let's have one more time. Just a quick note, the only thing my dad probably loves more than his children is the rapt attention of an audience. Um, so that may have just given him a heart attack. So he's, he's with the right people. <laughs> OK. Uh, in 2009, my wife, Kate, gesture to her, demurely, <laughs> waves demurely. Um, and I moved to Richmond uh, from, from New York City. And all right, New York in the house. Hey, how about this? Is Richmond in the house? All right. Play to the crowd, pandering. <laughs> and we moved from New York for um, reasons a lot of people moved from New York. Uh, we were getting burnt out by the rat race. We wanted to be closer to family. And we knew we wanted to have kids soon, ish. I mean, we liked the idea of kids, but also we liked, you know, like life and shit. <laughs> uh, so the, the first couple years we were here was sort of a prolonged process of kicking a baby down the road, not literally. <laughs> uh, until one day, Kate was having a routine visit when her OB referred to her as being of advanced maternal age, which my wife did not take as a compliment. <laughs> And just like that, our reproductive efforts were kicked into high gear. So after a few successful months of trying, nothing sticking. It's very the details. <laughs> this is why they didn't want me to have slides. <laughs> uh, I, I had my situation examined. And what we saw under the microscope was a ragtag reproductive horde as vast and deformed as an army of orcs, <laughs> but with half the discipline. <laughs> so we enlisted the help of science. Um, we tried three rounds of IUI and nothing, so we had one last Hail Mary pass at IVF which stands for intravenial in vitro fertilization. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and for those who are unfamiliar with the experience, I'll kind of walk you through it. We pump her full of drugs, take out her stuff. I put my stuff in her stuff. We put our stuff back in her. This is the abridged version. Um, and then you wait, and you hope it takes. Uh, and about two weeks go by, and she is showing no signs of being pregnant, and our hopes are low, and we think it's a loss, and we have to move on. Uh, but then out of the blue, we get a call. Blood test came back. She's pregnant, and we're elated. A year ago, we didn't want a baby disrupting our brunch plans, 
but now this is the answer to all our prayers. <laughs> People are dumb. <laughs> so we can do our first ultrasound, and our fertility doctor is this very kind and quiet man who, when he isn't elbows deep in my wife, more or less keeps to himself. <laughs> um, He's, he's doing his thing, and um, he eventually says, you know, I think the headline today is, there's a second heartbeat in there. Spoiler alert, you guys know where this is going, but whatever. Just <laughs> suspend your disbelief for a second. Um, so I should give you a little context. So when, when we did IVF, we only had two viable eggs to work with, and in the game of IVF, that is a pretty weak hand. Um, with one egg, you have about a 30% chance of having any kids at all. We knew if we put two in, that raises our probability to 50 of having a kid. And we're running about a 30% risk of twins. We weighed the option, and although twins seems like more than we felt like we could handle, we figured having two kids was better than having none, so let's roll the dice on twins. All to say we were sort of, we had mentally prepared ourselves, and when they found that second heartbeat, we took it in stride. Twins. Ah, that's so us. That's quirky. We're going to be like Tegan and Sarah. So we call our parents twins. Oh, that's so you. I know. That's quirky. I know, like Tegan and Sarah, right? What? Was, never mind. As we're leaving, I remember shaking the doctor's hand with like two fisted handshake. Thank you, doctor. You're a miracle worker. Thank you for my family. Oh, my family, thank you so much. <laughs> and he's like, OK, um, I did notice that one of the hearts was smaller than the others. So nothing to be concerned about. There's just a, you know, one mate trying to eat the other or something. Um, <laughs> so I want to have you back in next week. Let's, let's stay on top of that. So we come back the following week for the second ultrasound. And Dr. Ginn's up there, his magic wand. And he is very quiet for what feels like a very long time. And then he finally says, as I'm sort of like nudging him, like, how's, how's that heart? How's that heart looking, Doc? Oh, it, it's, it's, heart's fine. I think the headline today, <laughs> that there is a third heartbeat in there. <laughs> for approximately one second, my wife and I look at each other and feign anything but sheer horror. <laughs> ah! Because <laughs> we're doing the mental calculations. Three kids, two bedrooms, three kids, two parents, three kids, two boobs. <laughs> three kids, two incomes. Not even. She was a fourth of a, of a struggling startup. I was a bartender and part-time actor in Richmond. <laughs> what? What am I going to do with triplets? I didn't shake the doctor's hand on the way there. I just gave him a look like, you sick son of a bitch. What kind of island of Dr. Moreau shit are you trying to pull in? That was a weird reference that I just pulled out of nowhere. I hope someone has seen that movie. I haven't. I hope that reference even makes sense in the context. Um, Kate cried the whole way home. I treated myself to a glass of whiskey at 10 AM. I bought the first and only pack of cigarettes I've ever purchased in my life, and I was, and I was terrible at it. I asked for lucky strikes. Apparently, they don't, haven't made those in quite some time. So just walking around my neighborhood, smoking my not lucky strikes in my own personal post-apocalyptic dystopia. That, I mean, that sounds bad, and I feel ungrateful saying it. But you know, we had plans for our lives. She was working at a startup. She wanted to be able to take risks. I was trying to open up my own restaurant. I had a business plan and a brand, and was looking for funding. Like, we had something planned out, and then a meteor just came and decimated that whole thing in a single instant. 
it really felt like a cataclysmic event. Um, and you know, over the ensuing months throughout the pregnancy, the mood lightened a little bit, but there's always this sense of impending doom. Nesting for triplets isn't like the standard, what color are we gonna paint this wall? Oh, he's gonna sleep there. It's like you're preparing for a hurricane. It's more just like, board up the windows and put your head between your knees. Kiss your ass goodbye. But I gotta say, when they finally came, it wasn't that bad. Just kidding, it was a nightmare. <laughs> I mean, we tried to live a normal life. We wanted to be social and like, have actual human conversations with people. But it's just impossible. You end up coming off like this pathetic, perpetually panicked animal that has no business in civilized society. You're trying to make like, small talk like, oh, I, I, oh, they have cold brew there now? That's cool. Is it good? Buddy, 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 put that down. Buddy, put that down. Buddy, no. It's dangerous. What is he eating? What is he eating? Is this food? Is he, where's third baby? Where's third baby? Where's my third baby? <laughs> so the cold brew is good? <laughs> I swear, no joke, one barbecue we went to, we weren't there for, three, for 30 minutes. And one, just one of my kids in that 30 minutes fell down, scraped both knees, took a big swig of white sangria, <laughs> and licked a dog turd off a brick. <laughs> this was our life. Thank you for applauding my son licking a dog turd off a brick. Let's encourage that. You got that, Finn? <laughs> Keep it up. But nothing, nothing compared to that first year. We subsisted on 90 minutes of non-consecutive sleep a night. Little 15 minute chunks, it's not an exaggeration. We would, we would gladly drive three, three and a half hours to her mom's house just so we could take a nap. And you see why they use sleep deprivation as a torture device, because <laughs> you would give up anything just to close your eyes for a few freaking minutes. And you lose touch with reality, you go insane. One afternoon, uh, Kate was, was struggling to look up something on her iPhone, and then it dawned on her that her phone was a baby. <laughs> I have a memory of sitting down at our, at our dining room table with my morning coffee at 4 p.m. and completely earnestly asking the question, is today yesterday? <laughs> and the answer was yes. Today was yesterday. Phones were babies. We were through the looking glass. We can laugh at it now, but in that period, every moment of every day felt like chaos, and chaos can take a toll. There was no, we had no control, there was no order, there was no dividing up the day, and except for the rare occasions where we had some family visit us, there was no relief. We were on 24 seven, and it breaks you down. And I remember a particular low point, just tending to a crying baby, just being so exhausted and out of it, and picking him up, and instead of cuddling him or soothing him to sleep, I just like pulled him up to my scrunched up face and just like hissed the most disgusting <laughs> language at him. Like, stop right now and think of the five worst words in the English language. <laughs> Everyone got it? Yep. Okay, four of them were in there, I promise you. Can't guarantee what order. Um, and then I put him back in his crib and I walked back to my bed and I sat on the edge of the bed and I just wept. And you weep not just because you hissed all this vitriol at this defenseless little infant of whom your job is to nurture and protect, but you weep because you don't recognize yourself anymore. Because chaos has consumed you. You are no longer a victim of chaos, you're an instrument of it. So what is chaos? Now, I made a pact with myself that I wouldn't resort to the, the hackneyed uh, Webster's Dictionary defines chaos as, you guys deserve better than that. Oxford Dictionary <laughs> defines chaos as complete disorder and confusion, and that feels like a pretty accurate representation of our common understanding of chaos. It certainly sounds like an accurate representation of the stories I've been sharing with you. 
But that's only half the truth. Because there's a bias inherent in that definition that protects us from a bigger truth. And if you look at a more scientific understanding of chaos, that bias is exposed. So chaos theory, simplified, is the study of apparently random and unpredictable behavior. And the least assuming word in that phrase is the most important. Apparently random and unpredictable behavior. Apparently. Chaos isn't randomness. Chaos is not the absence of order or logic. Chaos is in the eye of the beholder. And through the study of chaos, we've discovered that systems that we once thought were random were actually driven by an underlying logic. It was just beyond our current comprehension. It just didn't fit with our limited understanding of what the world was at the time. And by learning from that chaos, we expanded our understanding of the world. Note how every vivid description I shared of my interaction with my kids was all from my perspective. And what it doesn't account for is that on the other side of what I perceived as chaos were the intentional actions of three beings who just wanted to be fed or changed or held or soothed or just wanted to enjoy the simple pleasure of licking shit off a brick. <laughs> To loosen our grip on this neat and narrow idea of how things should be, to greet the chaos in front of us with curiosity and empathy, to step outside of ourselves and understand what's behind that chaos, that is our charge as a parent. And in a way, this is our business as a species. Through science, we decode the chaos of the universe. Through art and music, we give form to the formless. We bring structure to emotions and sensations that are otherwise inexpressible. Through anthropology, we find common threads with disparate cultures. This is what we do. Like yeast that consume sugar and fart out CO2 and alcohol, and in turn give us bread and cake and pie and beer and wine and everything that makes life worth living, so do we consume chaos and fart out meaning. Chaos is the combustible substance that fuels our evolution. And it also fuels our creativity. To make the album Bitches Brew, Miles Davis surrounded himself with very proficient musicians, but put them all on instruments that they were pretty uncomfortable with. And the history of music and art is rife with examples of this, of introducing a little unpredictability to get a better output. Now what's interesting is what artists have explored over time and intuitively science supports empirically. A study of the brain has shown that the introduction of a little controlled chaos actually makes us better problem solvers. When we introduce a splash of unpredictability, what happens is we become less likely to settle for the easiest and most obvious and what is often a substandard solution and it forces us to think of bigger and broader ideas. This is how the brain works. So as you leave here, I encourage you to invite a little controlled chaos into your work. You don't necessarily have to have triplets. <laughs> I want to make it clear, that's, that's not the moral here. That's not what I'm driving at. Um, you don't have to do something drastic, but do something different. Okay? Break up your routine. It could be as simple as going for a walk. Work in a different environment. Broaden your aperture for inspiration. You know, don't just look at what's going on inside your field or your medium. Look outside for inspiration. Bring in outside voices. You know, seek the opinion of non-experts. Maybe even someone that doesn't know anything about what you're working at. Get their reaction to it. If you're a scrappy startup brand firm like Joe Smith, hire a bartender with triplets. <laughs> Who wants to make more than $3 an hour plus tips? Take a risk. Relax your urge to have control. Make yourself react to something. Share a half-baked idea and see what the conversation does to it. And I promise you, when you do this, there will be moments where you feel awkward and untethered and unsure of what you're doing. And that is when you know you are doing it right. 
When you feel like you're losing your way, keep going. You're almost there. When chaos bears down on you, embrace it. Lean into it. And when life hands you a brick covered in shit, <laughs> lick it. <laughs> Thank you. for that one because she deserves it and two because she hates that <laughs> she hates attention did you ever start the restaurant yeah. no <laughs> no um my great and talented friend lauren was here and she she designed the logo for it and the logo to this day says established 2012. <laughs> never established nah um but i mean i think my my personal story kind of speaks to how even uncontrolled chaos can, can be kind of a transformative thing because it opened me up to, I mean, I'm in a line of work now that I didn't know exists that I love. I wouldn't be here, you know, if I wasn't sort of ping-ponged about throughout life. So the restaurant didn't happen. Um, I still love restaurants, but I'm, I'm happy where I am. <laughs> uh, how do you take the lessons that you learn from all that chaos um, to That's great. Um, that's a good question. So I think I'm still so in the swirl. I'm not at a point where I could be like, hmm, this is an interesting lesson. You know, it's all still happening in real time. But I'll say one way that it has conditioned me is like, I'm not scared of nothing. <laughs> you know, by like, I mean, you know, when, when you're, especially when you're walking a client through, something unexpected, you know? There's, there's always that point of creativity. Strategy gets you so far, and then there's sort of a leap into the void when you reach a solution, and that can be a scary thing. And part of my job is to walk clients through it and to make sure we're all still brave. And that scares me, but I tell you what, it doesn't scare me as much as the time that I heard, Daddy, come wipe me, from three different bathrooms <laughs> at the exact same time. So I'd say that's probably the biggest thing. It sort of conditioned me to like be able to roll the punches a bit. Any other questions? Talked about wiping butts and everyone playing. I know that you're still in the swirl of it and that there's tons of chaos right now, but how do you imagine as your kids grow older, like keeping that sort of like controlled chaos in their lives? <laughs> or maybe they'll well, have yeah. <laughs> That never occurred to me. And it, it feels like we have an unlimited source right now. Um, but, but that's a, I mean, I think it's very important to, to us to, for both our kids and ourselves to constantly expose ourselves to new perspectives and new experiences. So I, I would say that is, is one way we want to do it. We don't want to let any of us get too comfortable and let our understanding of the world shrink. So you got to keep opening that aperture and, and letting a little of that chaos in. But I, I, do I choose? Who chooses things? Okay. 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 Um, I think this kind of piggybacks on that. You had said that um, you were kind of on 24 7 and it was breaking you down, and you were no longer a victim, and it was more you were being used as an instrument on it. How do you get out of that cycle and the complacency of the chaos? Um, you take a nap. I mean, literally, like, part of it was just a biological thing. Like, that first year sucked just because we didn't have sleep, you know? It wasn't so much like an existential. We didn't have time for the existential crisis of it. They came. But it was just because we couldn't sleep. Um, 
you know, I'll try and answer your question a little bit better. Um, I'm still figuring it out, and I don't have it all figured out. And you know, I, I sort of posited that our, our goal as parents is to be able to step out of it and empathize with what's behind the chaos. That is our North Star, and I fail every day, multiple times a day. And I, th I think it's just a constant exercise of pulling yourself out and, and realizing that, okay, this isn't about you. You know, every, all, all your muscles are like, this isn't how it's supposed to go. I have to do this. Um, but the act of being a parent is to step back. It, does, it doesn't matter. Let it go and try and make it a teaching moment. Have you ever thought of taking the show on the road? This is the first time I've done it, so n right now I'm thinking of it. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Wow, um, and that is uh, that's going to depend on the particulars, right? So, well, oh yeah, sorry. So to repeat the question, what if the chaos is coming from the client, right? How do you navigate that? Um, there is productive, controlled chaos, and then there is destructive chaos, right? So there's that little chaos we want to seek out where there's a little unpredictability, um, opening ourselves up to other perspectives, but it's a bit of a controlled environment. But sometimes people can exert true randomness and destructiveness. Um, I've always found it helps to keep the eyes on the work, to keep the eyes on the big picture. So that starts with like making them together, building the strategy, committing to a strategy. Here's what we want to accomplish, right? And all the way throughout the whole process, and what, what do you do? Okay. Right. <laughs> Stupid me to ask a question like that. But okay, um, yeah, so whatever you do, this kind of applies broadly. Um, walk them through the whole process so you're building a case. Because um, people in work like this, people get really personal. Um, and the more you can make it less about you and them and more about the work and what we're working towards, the better off you're going to be. So, about your munchkins. <laughs> There's bad enough to raise three singletons at a time. Are these identical triplets, or were you spared that level of chaos? <laughs> <laughs> Two identicals, one fraternal. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting dynamic. Um, and they're all completely different personalities. I mean, there's still, there's a little bit of hive mind for sure, but from the jump, they've all exhibited different personalities. So it, it's, that aspect has been a complete trip. And by the way, they're, they're five years old now, and they started kindergarten. Oh. Yeah. It's better storytelling if it's all the, oh, well, it was me. It was crazy. But there's part of me that just wants to show you slideshows of pictures and be like, aren't they cute? I can't. I don't have a slideshow. Hi, I'm Carl. I'm an experience designer at ICF Olsen. Uh, so historically, chaos has brought about many great things um, in human history. Uh, well, how can we benefit from chaos in this community? In this community, uh, d define a little bit more what you mean by this community. In Richmond? In Richmond. Huh. How can we benefit from chaos? I, I think a big part of it is g getting out of our bubbles. Um, Richmond, unlike a lot of, or much like a lot of cities this size and a lot of cities in the United States in general, is very divided and people just find their own little niche. And I think as individuals and as communities, we need to keep inviting outside voices in so that the inside becomes the outside. I think that's the kind of controlled and very productive chaos that we are, we are all missing. Um, thank you. Cool, thank you. I, so I'll give you a, a particular example. Like I started volunteering with, a, with an organization. I spent a long time, I like hem and haw over decisions. I spent a long time trying to find an organization that I wanted to volunteer for. But one of the factors I had was I wanted to be around people that were unlike me, that had different experiences like me, and I had to sort of absorb some other different energy and a different perspective. So I think there are very intentional ways we can do it as, as